Good afternoon, everyone. As you can see, I'm joined today by Ian Livingston, Chief Constable of Police Scotland, and by Professor Jason Leach, our National Clinical Director. I'll start today, as I always do, by updating you on some of the key statistics in relation to COVID-19. As at nine o'clock this morning, there have been 15,582 positive cases confirmed, which is an increase of 29 from yesterday. A total of 995 patients are in hospital with confirmed or suspected COVID-19. That represents uh, a decrease of 26 from yesterday, including uh, a decrease of nine in the number of confirmed cases. Now, as I said yesterday in relation to the number of people who had, uh, had their deaths registered in the previous day, we have to be very careful at reading too much into single day figures. But nevertheless, I think it is uh, reasonable to point out that this is the first time since the 30th of March that the numbers of patients in hospital, it has been lower than 1,000. So again, a positive indication of the progress that we are making. A total of 23 people last night were in intensive care with confirmed or suspected COVID-19, um, and that is a decrease of five since yesterday. I'm also able to confirm today that since the 5th of March, a total of 3,778 patients who had tested positive for the virus have now been able to leave hospital. In the last 24 hours, though, 14 deaths have been registered of patients confirmed through a test as having COVID-19, and that takes the total number of deaths in Scotland under that measurement to 2,409. Now, as I always do, I want to stress that these numbers are not just statistics. They are individuals whose loss is being deeply felt by their loved ones. So once again, I want to send my deepest condolences to everyone who has lost a loved one to this virus. I also want to express my thanks, as I always do, to our health and care workers. Your efforts are enormously appreciated, and not just by me and by the Scottish Government. Uh, they are appreciated, I know, by everyone in Scotland. There are, of course, many other frontline and key workers who are helping the country through this crisis. And with the Chief Constable here today, I want to take the opportunity to say a special thank you again to our police officers and staff. They are also working under real pressure at the moment, but they are doing an exceptional job for all of us. There are two items I want to cover today. Uh, the first concerns the economic impact of COVID-19. I have uh, just come earlier from the Cabinet Subcommittee on the Economy earlier this morning where we noted the latest monthly report from our chief economist. That document, uh, which was published this morning, provides a summary of Scotland's key economic statistics. Among other things, it shows that in the first half of May, almost one-fifth of businesses in Scotland were temporarily closed, and that contributed to more than 750,000 people being furloughed or unable to work as normal. The report also shows that turnover is down in almost every sector of our economy and it contains new modelling which takes account of the different phases for easing lockdown. On that basis, the report forecasts a more gradual economic recovery, uh, one which might not see us return to pre-crisis levels for a number of years. In short, today's publication confirms the scale of the economic crisis that we now face and in doing that, it further underlines why government action is so important and why it will continue to be so important. Uh, the Scottish Government has already allocated more than £2.3 billion to help businesses and protect jobs. And, of course, that's before we consider important UK-wide measures currently in place, such as the Job Retention Scheme. That kind of support is helping to mitigate some of the economic impact of this crisis and it will continue to be vital as our businesses seek to rebuild. And I want to, again today, give an assurance that the Scottish Government is determined to do everything we can to support that process of rebuilding and recovery. We will continue to do everything possible to protect your livelihoods. That's important in the short term, but it is also vital to help lay the groundwork for a sustainable economic recovery. Of course, that recovery will be helped uh, by continued progress against this virus. If we have a setback in tackling the virus, it will make the reopening of our economy all the more difficult. So the second item I want to cover today is directly related to the first, and it concerns 
the current lockdown restrictions uh, and particularly how I hope uh, people will comply with them over this weekend and beyond. We're now, of course, at the close of the first full week since we moved into phase one of our route map out of lockdown uh, and eased some of the restrictions. So far, the vast majority of people have stuck by the new rules and I want to take the opportunity again today to thank all of you who have continued to do the right thing. However, it's also clear that over the past week, not absolutely everyone has done that. Uh, the Chief Constable uh, may say uh, more later about compliance and how uh, the restrictions will be enforced if necessary. Uh, but for my part, I want to set out very clearly again today what the current rules are. And to do that, instead of focusing on what we are now allowed to do, I want to again emphasise what we're asking everyone not to do. Because it's by not doing the things that we know from the evidence allows the virus to spread more easily that we will keep it under control. So to start, you mustn't meet people from other households indoors. I know that might be a particular temptation on a weekend like this when we're expecting, again, poor weather. But let me be clear, that is extremely high risk. We know, and we don't know everything yet about this virus, but we do know that it transmits much more easily between people inside than it does outside. So if you're not willing to meet outdoors in uh, all likelihood the rain, please do not meet up with people from other households at all. Uh, and I cannot emphasise that strongly enough. I'm not exaggerating when I say that if you do meet people from other households indoors, you are putting yourselves and you are putting them at risk of getting the virus, of becoming ill with it and potentially dying from it. And I would ask you not, please, to take that risk. However, while the risk of meeting outdoors is lower, it's not absolutely zero. So that means if you do meet outdoors, you must not get within two metres of members of another household. You should certainly not be shaking their hands or hugging them, difficult though, I know that is. And you shouldn't share food or utensils with people from other households or touch hard surfaces that they may also have touched. Because again, these are ways in which we know the virus spreads relatively easily. And we're asking that when two households do meet up, there should be no more than eight people in total in a group. In addition, you should not go more than five miles for recreation and you shouldn't leave your face uncovered if you are in an enclosed space like a shop and public transport. Wearing a face covering uh, helps you protect others and having others wear a face covering uh, is mean, means that they help protect you. A more general point I want to make is that even now, you should still be seeing far fewer people than you might normally do. And you should still be trying to stay at home as much as possible. Basically, if you start to feel that your social life is returning to normal, that's not a good sign right now. And that message applies to everyone, but it is perhaps particularly relevant to young people. So I want today to make a special plea to all of you, uh, the young people of Scotland. Many of you I know will be desperate to spend more time with your pals after weeks of being apart. You might even think that as young people, you are less likely to become seriously ill as a result of the virus. And I know this from speaking to the young people in my own life. But I want to be very clear, you are not immune from this virus. You can get it and it can be very harmful to you. But even if you're not seriously affected yourself, you can still pass it on to other young people. They might then pass it on to others who are at greater risk from COVID-19, such as their parents or grandparents. And that could have really tragic consequences. So I would urge you, and I know you all know how important this is, please don't just think about your own risk. Please think about the risks to your parents and your grandparents and to your friends, parents and grandparents. Don't take risks that you could end up regretting and possibly grieving in the weeks ahead. Please stick to the rules. I can also say, uh, finally, just a, a very brief word uh, and a very heartfelt word to those who I know want to make their voices heard this weekend in support of Black Lives Matter. And I want to urge you to make your voices heard. We all feel very strongly about this, but I want to ask you to do so safely. In normal times, I may well have been planning to join a gathering of support this weekend. But coming together in mass gatherings right now is simply not safe. It poses a real risk to health and it poses a real risk to life. 
So I would encourage you to read the statement that was issued yesterday uh, by Carrie Johnson, uh, Sheikh Ubayu's sister, and by Hamza Yusuf, Anis Sarwar, and Amar Anwar, asking people to protest in different ways. For example, you can make your voice heard online, you can lobby elected representatives, or you can make a donation to anti-racism campaigns. But please, please try to stay within the rules that are there for your own protection. And above all, please stay safe. In fact, that's a message which all of us should heed. Uh, if you're wondering whether or not it's OK to do something this weekend, ask yourself if you're giving the virus an opportunity to spread. And if you're in doubt about whether your plans are within the rules or not, please err on the side of caution. Above all else, please remember that every single decision we take right now as individuals will affect the safety and the well-being of everyone. The progress we've made against this virus over these past few weeks is real, uh, and I say that every day because I mean it, and it is as a result of all of us overwhelmingly sticking to these rules. And that kind of collective effort will continue to be vital as we slow the spread of the virus even further. Uh, so I'm confident that the vast majority of you will continue to play your part, and I want to thank all of you in advance for showing that solidarity with each other uh, and for doing exactly that. I'm going to hand on now to uh, the Chief Constable before I hand over to Professor Leach. Uh, but firstly, uh, Ian. Thank you, First Minister, and, and good afternoon. And as, as we enter early June and, and we enter the summer months, I'd like to start on a point I've stressed on a number of occasions recently, and that's by underlining the close bond that exists between policing and the communities of Scotland that we serve. It's a precious bond of trust that's been forged over many years, and policing in Scotland takes its authority and legitimacy from the people. It's testament to the common sense, good judgment of the people of Scotland and our police service that during this national public health emergency, the relationship, if anything, has gone from strength to strength. Now, of course, the bond will be tested during difficult times, like just now, through the pandemic, or when critical incidents occur, when tragedy arises, when human life is lost. And I know the role of the police, the coercive authority, policing at times exercises in the name of our fellow citizens to protect us all, will rightly be subject to robust scrutiny, focus and challenge. And I welcome that challenge. I welcome an open, direct, transparent conversation about policing. It's absolutely vital to democracy and it's vital to fairness. Like everyone, I, as Chief Constable uh, and as a man, it was shocked and distressed by the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis and the subsequent events that transpired and continued to transpire in the United States. Racism in all its forms is utterly disgraceful and unacceptable. Now, as with the First Minister, I also fully understand the desire of people in Scotland to make their voices heard this weekend over racial injustice. The right to be heard, to protest, to campaign, is of vital importance and policing has a key role in enabling, supporting such freedoms to be exercised fully and safely. Our duty in policing is to enable you to have your voice heard in a way that is safe for you and safe for others. So please do this in a way that does not risk spreading coronavirus. Policing in Scotland will help in this regard. I know, uh, again, as a First Minister has alluded to, there are a number of planned events this weekend and we are in touch uh, with some of the people involved in organising them to try to help them to do that in a safe manner. I urge everyone to follow the regulations and guidance as the majority of people have thankfully done over the past 10 weeks or so to keep themselves and others safe and to prevent the spread of coronavirus. I would also reiterate the comments of the Cabinet Secretary for Justice Hamza Yusuf, because the threat of coronavirus is still with us, people should not attend mass gatherings which pose a clear risk to public health. Please find a safe way to have your voice heard. I know the fatigue and strain many are feeling as the stay-at-home period continues, albeit uh, with some restrictions lifted, is one that is felt amongst households and families right across Scotland. And again, as the First Minister has made clear repeatedly, uh, the desire uh, for easement uh, to allow greater freedom uh, is, of course, 
understandable. The small changes made last week, following 10 weeks of strict lockdown rules, did coincide with particularly good weather and, in my judgment, did lead some people feeling and acting, uh, to be frank, a bit demob happy. Gatherings at parks, beaches, beauty spots were concerning and policing made over 2,000 separate dispersals over the 72-hour weekend period. And now, at the same time, we saw non-coronavirus related crime returning to levels which are more in line with what we would call business as usual. And we, in fact, made over 1,000 arrests last weekend. None of them, it has to be said, in regard to breach of the uh, coronavirus regulations. But collectively, that puts uh, an acute demand on, on policing. But I do pay tribute to everyone who is working together uh, to save lives. The majority of people do continue to do the right thing, and they do that because they know that's the best way to protect themselves, uh, to stop the virus spreading, and ultimately to reduce the chance of people dying. This weekend, I don't think uh, the weather is to be quite as good, but I would ask fundamentally that people do not travel to busy places, and crucially, crucially, again, emphasising uh, the point that the, the First Minister has made very strongly uh, today, do not hold house parties or gatherings indoors. Uh, the police service uh, will take very robust action in that regard because we know uh, that that is, is particularly dangerous in regard to the spread of the virus. Don't have house parties if the rain comes on. Don't get your friends round. It's not the time to do that. It is literally putting lives at risk. I also want, again, to thank uh, our officers and staff, and specifically our special constables, um, for their commitment uh, to public service, people giving freely of their own time. They've been working round the clock, all officers and staff, special constables uh, included uh, within the Police Service of Scotland, to give help, to give advice and to support communities uh, the length and breadth of Scotland. It is essential that everyone sticks with it essential that everyone sticks to the rules, do the right thing. If we don't, uh, more of what is currently guidance may well be brought into legislation. And if that is the case, Police Scotland will continue to act in a fair and proportionate manner. Uh, our approach won't change. We will always work with the people uh, to do the right thing because we rely on consent and cooperation. We will act with courtesy, but we will take enforcement measures when necessary. I greatly value uh, the trust of our fellow citizens and I thank you uh, for your forbearance during uh, these difficult days. Please look after yourselves, look after your families, look after each other and follow the rules. Thank you, First Minister. Thank you very much, Chief Constable. Um, I'll hand over now to Chris Leach. Thank you, First Minister. I, I simply want to reinforce very briefly some of the key messages you've heard from both the First Minister and the Chief Constable. In amongst all of this complexity and the response to the virus, the virus itself is relatively simple. The enemy we face is unseen. It is everywhere. It is potentially anywhere. It is all around us each and every day. It's spread from one human to another. It is spread from person to person. You get this virus from other people. The more people you come into contact with, the more likely you are to catch and spread the virus. We all want to get back to some semblance of a normal life and as soon as possible. But the only way we can do that is by sticking to the rules today. And then we can progressively move out of lockdown. The meeting up with other people has been the biggest change for a lot of us over the last week. And I want to take this opportunity to remind you again, all three of us have done this, that how important it is that you only meet up outdoors and in small groups. Eight is the largest group we want. Actually, we'd like you to meet in smaller groups. This is because the outdoors, there is a significantly lower risk of catching the virus. There is fresh air, there are fewer surfaces to touch, and it's much easier to stay physically distanced from those around you. So now we've got another weekend coming up. The weather doesn't look as, as if it's going to be so good, but please don't be tempted to go indoors. And you might need to take an umbrella and a fleece with you to meet up outdoors, but it will save you from 
the virus. And remember the five things that haven't changed at all throughout any of this renewal and recovery work. Remember to wash your hands with soap and water for 20 seconds if you possibly can, and use hand sanitizer if you can't. Keep two meters apart from people outside your household, and wear a cloth face covering if you're in a crowded place like public transport or a shop. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Cover your mouth and nose if you sneeze or cough. Discard a handkerchief if you sneeze into it. And finally, clean all the surfaces that you touch regularly and just with household wipes. Doing all of those things, but in particular the physical distancing, will stop the spread of this virus. The numbers will continue to fall, as you've heard already today, and we will be able to move through the route map. Okay, important and very sound advice uh, there. I'm going to now move uh, straight to questions. Uh, the first question today comes from Katie Hunter, BBC Scotland. Afternoon, everyone. Um, I think we were expecting to hear more about the regulations for the 14-day quarantine um, today. I understand that's now been delayed until Monday. Um, there's a lot of concern from within the airline and tourism industry that this is an, an ill-conceived policy. Um, First Minister, I'd ask how you react to that. And also to the Chief Constable, with the regulations being laid later than we expected and the Scottish Police Federation um, raising concerns about the quarantine plan, how will this be effectively enforced? Uh, well, the Scottish Government has said all along we would take time to get our regulations in place. Obviously, this is a, a policy decision that is being made by the UK Government. I'm on record previously as saying that we have to consider uh, the issue of the potential for the infection to come into the country from outside as we go into a phase of, of trying to suppress it. Uh, but issues of enforcement and financial penalties for breach of these regulations are issues for the Scottish Government to determine. And all along, uh, we have said, and, and I have uh, said, that we need to make sure that the approach we take to enforcement and indeed the approach we take to financial penalties or any uh, future uh, further prosecution uh, that arises from breach must fit within the distinctive Scottish criminal justice system. And, and that's what we are working to ensure. And around enforcement, we also have to make sure that we are not putting undue uh, pressure on the police. Uh, because as uh, you heard from the Chief Constable earlier on, the police are already uh, working under pressure because of some of the aspects of uh, dealing with coronavirus. So these are things we're giving careful consideration to. Uh, we will publish the regulations uh, uh, over uh, the, the weekend into uh, Monday and when we uh, do so I, I hope people will see that we've taken great care in coming to the right decisions there but I'll, I'll hand over to the Chief Constable to say perhaps a word from uh, the policing perspective. Thank you. Um, we recognise this is a, a, a very challenging issue and, and to an extent quite a, a, a controversial issue um, but again the reasons for it are for solid public health grounds to, to try to prevent uh, the spread of the coronavirus. Um, the police service, we've been working very closely uh, with our colleagues in, in public health, very closely with officials in, in Scottish Government, as well as the Crown Office and Procurator uh, Fiscal Service to look at uh, the best mechanism uh, to ensure the maximum uh, compliance and cooperation from people uh, who are subject to a quarantine, uh, quarantine period. Um, from my perspective, uh, I uh, fundamentally see the police having a backstop role here we will have to uh, support uh, the wider national interest uh, as required, uh, but I think it will be public health led uh, with uh, a, a backstop of policing when required is, is how I see it going. But there's an awful lot of work ongoing literally as we speak uh, today and, and into tomorrow uh, to finalise uh, the regulations as the First Minister outlined. And I agree wholeheartedly with the Chief Constable's uh, comments there about this being public health led with any role for the police being um, a backstop one. Can I say a, a final word actually, which I should have said in my initial answer about the concerns of the airline um, industry, but I think uh, the, the concerns about the tourist uh, industry more generally. I absolutely understand that this is a, a sector that is already extremely hard hit by the impact of coronavirus and uh, the concerns uh, that it will have about further uh, restrictions to uh, travel and tourism are are well understood and, and completely understandable. Um, but this is public health driven. And what I would say is none of us want arrangements like this to be in place for any longer than is absolutely necessary. So one other important aspect of uh, an arrangement like this is how it is kept under review and how we exit from it as, as we uh, continue to tackle the virus. Um, I, uh, one of the things I, I feel most strongly about and always have done, and people will have heard me uh, talk about this in many other contexts in the past, is that Scotland is an open, welcoming 
tolerant country. We, we value having people coming to Scotland to live, uh, to study, to visit, to, to enjoy everything that our, our beautiful country has to offer. And I can't wait for the day when we're back to a situation where that's the message I'm giving to the world. Please come to Scotland because we want you here. and We want you to see uh, what our country has to offer. Uh, but these kinds of restrictions right now are because we need to make sure we suppress this virus and keep it suppressed and be very vigilant for the different ways in which it could run out of control again. But none of us want these kinds of arrangements to be in place longer than is absolutely necessary. Uh, Stephen Brown from STV. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I know that uh, yesterday you spoke about the possibility of face coverings becoming mandatory uh, in Scotland. But given what happened yesterday in England and the announcement on public transport there, do you feel that may make that decision uh, within Scotland happen sooner? And to the Chief Constable, if we got to a stage where it was mandatory to um, wear face coverings in places like shops, how difficult might be that be for officers to enforce? Uh, well, I'll hand over to the Chief in a second. From my uh, perspective, it, yesterday's announcement by the UK government in terms of public transport, uh, whether or not they choose to go further, I, I don't know, um, doesn't change the consideration uh, that we're uh, currently have underway. We, we were already looking at that. We will continue to go through that process and come to a view ourselves. And I would hope to set that out in the uh, reasonably near future. But uh, what I would also say right now is that just because it's not legally mandatory in Scotland does not detract from the fact that my very strong advice to people is to wear a face covering, not a medical mask, but a, a face covering that you can make out of an old t-shirt or a scarf. Uh, when you're in a shop or in public transport. Um, and to do that now, now I recognise, and I think it's always important to say that there will be some people uh, with particular health conditions, asthma, for example, where that will not be appropriate. And even if we make it mandatory, th these will require to be exemptions. But for the general population, my advice is wear a face covering in these situations. And just to, to repeat why it's important is if you have the virus, uh, but you might not know it because you're, you're not yet displaying symptoms, if you're wearing a face covering, then you are reducing the risk of you passing the virus to somebody else. Uh, and the other side of that is that if somebody that you are coming into uh, close proximity to in a shop or on a train or a bus has the virus without knowing it, if they're wearing a face covering, then uh, they are reducing their risk of passing it on to you. So it's one of these things we can all do for the protection of each other. So my strong advice is to do it now. Uh, don't wait for a decision on whether or not it is to become legally mandatory. Uh, Chief Constable. Thank you, and, and, and thank you for the, the, the question. I do agree, I think, with what's inferred in your question uh, about the potential difficulty uh, around enforcement. And what I would reflect upon is that our approach would be exactly the same as it's been uh, since mid to late March when, when we started to get involved in this public health um, priority. And that is to explain and, and to encourage uh, what uh, the rules are, uh, whether they are regulations uh, or, or whether they are guidance. And by and large, uh, that has, has overwhelmingly uh, proved successful. I think in this instance, in terms of the wearing of face masks, and, and if Parliament does mandate that in, into enforceable law, in my mind, I see some analogies with some other public health initiatives, such as the smoking in, in public places. Now, when that was introduced, um, we spent a lot of time, and I remember it, again, uh, explaining and encourage compliance. But more importantly than that, it was peer pressure and, and community compliance that got people to do the right thing, always knowing uh, that there was uh, the enforceability uh, from the police service if required. But our approach, I'd, I talked earlier about the crucial link between uh, the public and the police in, in Scotland. Uh, and we will work very, very closely to, to encourage and to explain the reason for that. Um, but I would expect that people would comply because that, they know that that's the right thing to do. Uh, and I would compare it to some other public health initiatives that have been introduced, where enforcement has been, has been uh, very minimal and yet compliance has been very high. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the Chief Constable makes some really important points there, and I think those analogies are, are very well made. I, I want to make a general point about enforcement and enforceability. With all of these things that we've been doing in recent months and may have to do in future, there are, of course, challenges around enforcement, and I 
you know, I'm full of admiration for the way Police Scotland have, have dealt with this up until now and full of confidence about how they will deal with anything uh, that uh, lies a ahead of us. But I, I just want to ensure, uh, assure people rather, that we listen very carefully to the, the views of the police in advance of making these decisions uh, and the views the police have about the practicalities of enforcement and enforceability. And that will always be the case because uh, we recognise that it's police officers on the front line that often have to, to, to make these difficult decisions. And uh, there's there's little point, I'm not talking here specifically about face coverings and us making laws for things if the police advice is that it's simply not possible to enforce. So these will continue to be very close discussions. And the final point I would make is I know that people out there um, will, will not, whatever their views on uh, the merits or otherwise of face coverings, will not relish this prospect because it's not comfortable uh, to wear a face covering. I absolutely recognise that. Uh, so please understand that if we are, as we are, strongly advising you to do it, and if we do in future go a step further and make it mandatory, it's because, after careful consideration, we think it can make a difference to suppressing this virus. And we're all having to do things, we're all having to stop ourselves doing things right now that we'd rather not be in, in the position of. But this is all about stopping in its tracks, as far as we possibly can, a virus that unfortunately we know can be deadly. So don't forget to see all of these things, difficult though I know they are, in that overall context. Alan Smith from Burr. Good afternoon, First Minister. Um, speaking with you and Cameron on Radio Clyde this morning, you, you, you talked about Scotland having its own issues with racism. I just wondered if you could expand on that to perhaps the particular issues you're aware of within Scotland and what's been done about them. And a question for the Chief Constable, uh, you talked about the, the house parties that you're telling people not to have, uh, particularly this weekend with the, the wet weather. How, how do you police that? And do you expect people to, to phone police to, to raise concerns about their neighbours uh, having house parties? OK, I'll hand over to the Chief in a second. On um, my comments about racism, no country is immune from racism um, and any country that thinks it is or thinks it has solved the problem is actually potentially making that problem worse by not recognising it and, and trying to properly address it. And, and Scotland is not immune from racism. I, I represent uh, in Glasgow one of the most uh, racially diverse constituencies uh, in the country and, and I see that very directly, but it's not just uh, applicable to, to, to that geography. Um, so we, we have to recognise that, and all of us have to recognise uh, that every country has work still to do. Um, and that is about discrimination, it is about uh, you know, abuse or prejudice. Um, but the points I was making in my interview with you and Cameron uh, were actually about some of the most structural issues that we have to uh, deal with as well. And I made the point, which I'll make again here, is that I... I'm very privileged and have been privileged for more than 20 years now to be a member of uh, the Scottish Parliament. I'm now First Minister in that Parliament. Uh, but the, the number of uh, members from our minority ethnic communities that have been uh, represented in that Parliament are tiny still. And uh, there has never been a woman from our minority ethnic communities elected to be a member of the Parliament. That's not good enough. And all of us as individuals and all of the different parties across Scotland have a real uh, job to do there to put that right as quickly as possible. Um, and, you know, as First Minister, I know, and I know this is something that the Permanent Secretary of the Scottish Government is, uh, you know, very anxious to see progress on as well. We, we don't yet employ enough people from our minority ethnic communities. And, and this comes back to a general point that can be made about race, and I am making it about race, but it can also be made about gender and, and other groups within our society. If we don't have proper representation um, in the, uh, the areas where decisions are made, then our societies uh, are in danger of, of never uh, getting to a point where we are truly uh, and, and properly representative of all of the, the different strands that make up our country. So we've all got work to do there, and uh, none of us are perfect, and none of us always get this right, which is why... As we rightly now, and I, I don't shy away from this, I'm extremely critical of how the President of the United States is, is handling this particular moment in his country's history and the, what I would describe as the lack of leadership that he is showing. In being critical of that, we also have to look at our own countries and ourselves and make sure that we are all trying uh, to do the right things. And uh, I think that's important for all of us. Uh, I'll hand over to the Chief Constable now for uh, the part of the question that was to him. Well, th thanks again. I think it's an important question. Uh, and again, interestingly, 
First Minister, Professor Leach and myself all did stress the criticality of avoiding large gatherings indoors and, and house parties uh, being a, a prime example of that. And the reason for that is that all the medical science tells us that that's the, the highest area in that, uh, of risk in terms of transmission of the coronavirus. So in that regard, our approach in policing in Scotland has always been uh, to do it in a reasonable manner and to do our duty in a proportionate manner. Uh, and therefore, because of the, the high level of threat and the high level of risk attached to that, uh, we would be robust uh, in our dealings with house parties. But we would still start by explaining what the rules are, just in case there are people out there who, who think they're, they're not doing anything wrong. We'd explain what the rules are and we'd encourage them to comply with the rules. And thus far, again, overwhelmingly, when that action's been taken, people have uh, complied with that. So if you have concerns uh, this weekend, living in your own communities, you've got, you've got concerns that there, there is a, a house party going on somewhere, I would encourage you uh, to contact the police service because it's the right thing to do. You need to, to identify house parties if they're, if they're occurring. We'll deal with them in a fair, reasonable manner. We'll explain, we'll encourage people to do the right thing. But if they're not, we will enforce the law because there's high risk and high threat coming from having house parties indoors. OK, thank you. Uh, Tom Eden from PA. Thank you, First Minister. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, firstly, to the Chief Constable, um, having seen some of the, the vile behaviour of police officers in America, I was wondering what lessons of Police Scotland learned from this? And, have you, and what have you told your officers um, who are going to be policing this weekend's anti-racism protests? Um, and just a bit to delve a bit deeper into your answer, First Minister, to Alan, um, it's obviously very welcome to hear your sort of acknowledgement of structural problems, but have you taken any specific actions in light of recent events to tackle any institutional racism in government and parliament? Okay, I'll hand over to Chief Constable and then I'll answer your question. I mean, the first thing I would say is that uh, I find a number of those scenes absolutely abhorrent. I don't recognise uh, some of the scenes we've seen from the United States as reflecting how uh, the Police Service of Scotland conducts its, bus its business. I would also make a fundamental point that any police organisation anywhere in the world uh, is, is representative of and reflects uh, the society that they are drawn from. Now, as the First Minister has made clear, and I fully endorse and, and, and understand, um, this country of Scotland uh, is not uh, without racism. This country of Scotland is not without uh, racial uh, injustice. Um, but it doesn't reflect the history uh, of, of slavery and, and the history uh, of racial prejudice that does exist in the United States. So I don't expect police officers in Scotland to act in any way in some of the more extreme uh, and very uh, distressing scenes uh, that we've seen from various parts of the United States. What I expect of the police officers in Police Scotland is a continuation of what we've seen over many years, uh, but particularly in the last number of weeks and months, and that's working with the people of Scotland. You've often heard a, a, a renowned Pelian principle that the public are the police and the police are the public, and I fundamentally believe that. Uh, and to be true in Scotland. That's why I said we take our authority from the people we serve. So we'll act with courtesy, we'll act with empathy, we understand some of the hurt and anger that's felt. We will ensure that people get to have their voices heard, but crucially, vitally, as many, many people have encouraged people to do, do that in a way that is safe, that doesn't uh, ensure or doesn't allow the coronavirus to spread. Thank you. Thanks. Um, in relation to your question to me, uh, so, you know, I've already uh, this week had an initial discussion with the Permanent Secretary of the Scottish Government about how within the government we uh, both uh, address some of the underlying uh, structural uh, systemic issues in terms of underrepresentation in our own ranks, and I know that's something she is uh, very keen to uh, take forward with, with real pace. On the political side, um, you know, while for, for reasons people will understand, my mind has not really been on electoral politics recently. Uh, my party is thinking very uh, hard about how we uh, deal with the 
the challenge of underrepresentation uh, within our, our party ranks and in the, those we elect into, uh, whether it's council chambers across the country or the Scottish Parliament, and these uh, things uh, will, will continue. What I would say, though, is um, I, I think it's important for all of us that we uh, don't see, and particularly for people in leadership positions, that we don't see this as something uh, that is just about this week or next week when these things are so high profile in the media. This is about how on an ongoing basis uh, we address and make progress on all of these issues that have for far too long uh, not progressed uh, in the way that we would have wanted them to. Uh, so this is, uh, I hope, a, a catalyst moment in that, but it's, it's what we are doing and the progress we are making, I guess, when the media glare is not as much on these things as it is now that will be the, the measure of, of whether it has turned out to be that catalyst uh, or not. And I'm sure that is true in, in the police and I'm sure it is true in organisations uh, the length and breadth of the country. Uh, Chris Musson from The Sun. Hi, First Minister. On the economic analysis, um... Fraser Valander Institute also published their own analysis today, and it pointed out that the faster easing of lockdown in England meant we could be lagging behind on some measures in Scotland, like consumer demand and the housing market. Um, is this additional economic damage a, a price that you think is worth paying for a more cautious approach? Um, I, I think... So, I mean, these things, as you would imagine, um, occupy my mind literally uh, every minute of, of every day right now and, and trying to get that, that balance right between protecting health and suppressing the virus and opening and restarting our economy. And I think it's really important that we don't see these things uh, as, as being in competition because if, if we slip up on the first, we will make it harder to do the latter. So it's really important that we get these steps in, in sync. And we're taking the approach at the pace in Scotland that we think is right and in the overall longer term interest of not just opening the economy up, but opening the economy up in a sustainable way that doesn't have us a month, three months, six months from now having to go back the way and close down large parts of our economy. So we could go much quicker right now, uh, and I'm sure there would be people uh, that would welcome that. But if, if the price of that is that in some time in the not too distant future, I'm standing here saying, well, the virus has run out of control, so we're having to impose restrictions again, then that will not have turned out to be the right thing to do. So, you know, I, I would say, you know, candidly, I don't know that there is a completely absolute right and wrong answer here. But I'm just trying to do things at the pace that I think is right, that allows us to suppress the virus, open up the economy, but not risk a later peak of the virus that takes us all back to square one. And just getting these balances as right as possible is going to be a challenge uh, for quite some time to come. And, and part of the reason I, I think it's important to spend as much time standing here and explaining some of this thinking is so that there is, even if there's not unanimous agreement about all of the decisions we're taking, there's at least an understanding of what is driving these decisions and the pace at which we're taking them. Uh, Martin McLaughlin from The Scotsman. Good afternoon. Uh, Larry Flanagan from the EIS this morning told the Education Committee of Concerns that disadvantaged children are being disproportionately impacted by the new education model. And he argued the need for a new equity audit and action plan to ensure the attainment gap doesn't widen further. Uh, despite this, the Education Secretary has written to Education Director suspending the collection of literacy and numeracy attainment data. First Minister, since this outbreak began, you've addressed young people directly in several occasions, but I'd like to know what you'd say to young Scots from poor backgrounds. Can you reassure them that they won't be facing a, a lifelong de deficit as a consequence of this pandemic? Uh, I, I can stand here and, and I'll look directly into the camera for any young person that is watching this. I will do everything I can and my government will do everything I can to make sure uh, you don't pay a long-term price of what you've lived through in the past few months. And I say that to all young people, but I absolutely recognise uh, the disproportionate impact on young people who are living in more difficult, uh, vulnerable or, or deprived circumstances. And we will absolutely uh, leave no stone unturned in trying to make sure that the, uh, any impact you suffer is not greater as a result. On the uh, decision that the Education Secretary announced about the the gathering of the Curriculum for Excellence levels data. That is just a, an inescapable decision because schools have not been 
open and young people have not been at schools, it simply would be impossible. And you know, we, we look to all of the different ways in which it might be possible to do that. It simply would not be possible to do that in a meaningful way. But that does not mean we are not uh, hugely anxious about making sure that we understand these impacts and take action to mitigate these impacts. I've not... Uh, I've been in other meetings all morning, so I've not caught up with the evidence to the Education Committee um, this morning, but I will do so later. And obviously we are working with the education unions as we're working with parent groups in the Education Recovery Group that the, the Deputy First Minister, Education Secretary, chairs. And so all of these issues are hugely important. Uh, one of the things I... Uh, touched on when I set out the route map a couple of weeks ago was the investment we're making while young people will still be partly come August partly at school but partly learning at home we've announced some significant investment in electronic devices for young people from more deprived communities to try to to level that playing field but I don't underestimate the challenges here but I absolutely um, will do everything in my power the government will do everything in our power to make sure that the young people uh, of today don't pay a long-term price for what they've had to live through through absolutely no fault of their own. Uh, Tom Peterkin from the PNJ. Um, good afternoon. Um, a Scottish Government document suggests that um, the government is no longer accepting applications to its Seafood Resilience Fund, but are only around half of the 10 million funding has been passed on. Um, does this suggest that companies are missing out on support? No, I, I don't think it will. We will have these funds and then we will try in different ways to uh, assess whether we've met the demand, in which case we can recycle uh, any remaining monies into other forms of support or, or whether there is still an underlying demand. So we uh, want to make sure that every penny we have promised to the economy generally, to businesses generally, but to individual sectors, uh, go where it is intended. But, you know, we have to manage different schemes so that, so that we're not, uh, and I'm, I'm not here specifically talking about the seafood uh, scheme, but generally we don't want uh, particular schemes that may have uh, lower demand than we had previously thought sitting with underspend when that money could be supporting businesses and even businesses in the same sector in other ways. So we, we have to manage these things as, as carefully as possible, but the intention is to get as much money uh, into the hands of businesses as possible so that we can support them as, as far as possible through this crisis. Alistair Grant from The Herald. Alistair, are you there? Oh, hi, sorry, sorry. Uh, hi there. Um, I was just going to ask, uh, we also saw a surge in visitor numbers to some beauty spots and parks in Scotland last weekend. And I know the weather is not meant to be as good this weekend, uh, but can I ask the Chief Constable, will there be any increased police presence in these areas and in parks and beauty spots? Uh, and I, could I also ask, I know you said that you're in touch uh, with the organisers of Black Lives Matters protests. How will Police Scotland go about policing these protests in Scotland, given the potential for large crowds? Hand over to Chief Constable. Thank you. Well, on, on your first point, uh, visibility, uh, a preventative uh, profile and a preventative presence has been right at the heart of our approach since, since day one. Local commanders are, are identifying specific areas uh, within, with, within their own areas. Uh, very diverse country. Uh, we know there are different uh, beaches, locations, beauty spots. So therefore, they will know, uh, working with the colleagues in Transport Scotland, colleagues in, in local authorities, uh, the experience of, of, of people arriving and, and people moving. So we will have a uh, presence there. We will have significant visibility. One of the things that we've done uh, in the course of, of the last 10 to 11 weeks is to refocus a lot of our organisation into front-facing uh, community roles. Uh, so you will have seen far more police officers, police vehicles, people on bikes, uh, people walking uh, than would be normal. Uh, but that's been potentially at a price of other areas of our business in terms of some of the harms that may be arising in the online space uh, or potentially going forward uh, within the public protection space uh, as well. Um, so we are going to have to balance up the sustainability of what we've done over uh, the last number of weeks. But in key areas where experience, where professional knowledge, where common sense tells us people have been gathering, we will have significant levels of visibility, but we'll still be working with people to explain and encourage them uh, not 
uh, to breach the regulations, not uh, to put themselves and others at risk. So that you will see uh, a significant uh, visible presence uh, at, at these areas. Um, both, thank you, First Minister. The, uh, the, the First Minister and I, when we, we spoke at the outset, both made specific reference to the Black Lives Matter uh, protests uh, that are playing out right across the world. Uh, and rightly, rightly, people uh, wishing uh, to show their, their absolute disgust for racial prejudice and, and racial injustice. But it's coinciding at a time where the public health imperative still remains acute. And therefore, I greatly welcome the significant encouragement uh, from uh, the Cabinet Secretary for Justice, from, from Mr Sarwar, uh, from, from others, and, uh, from Carrie Johnston, uh, Sheikh Obayo's sister, and from Amar Anwar, uh, the, the well-known uh, lawyer uh, who has been working uh, with uh, the Bayo family. I welcome their encouragement for people to make their protest, uh, to hear, to have their voices heard, but do it in a way that is safe. We are trying as best as we can, to encourage people who are seeking to organise a number of these events uh, to look at alternate ways to do it, just as we're holding this press conference today. Just as this very morning I did a pass-out parade for 170 new police officers at Tully Allen um, with people watching from home, their families and friends. We did that in a way uh, that protected everybody and was done in line with the physical distancing measures. So it's important that people have the right to protest. It's important that people get to have their voice heard, but it's also important that it's done in a safe manner, and we will continue to encourage everyone uh, to do that, and we'll continue to do that right across this weekend. Thanks, Ruth. Uh, Paul Malik from The Courier. Good afternoon. Um, I was just released this morning by the Scottish Government showed that um, the economy might not return to the pre-coronavirus levels until 2023. First Minister, do you expect Scotland to be an independent country before then? Um, look, I think everybody knows my view on independence. I, I want Scotland to be an independent country. I hope that's soon. I think that brings lots of benefits. But um, that's not my focus right now. My focus is on tackling coronavirus, making sure we are tackling uh, the health uh, implications of the virus by suppressing it and stopping it running out of control again, um, and also doing everything we can to support the economy. And, and for the moment, that is going to continue uh, to be my focus and to encourage uh, people to come together and do the right thing. So we'll get, uh, I hope sooner rather than later, we'll all get back into uh, much more normality where the, the constitutional issues and the, the political debates we rightly have as part of a, a healthy, vibrant democracy will come to the four again, but I'm going to keep my focus for now uh, on the immediate challenges that lie ahead of the country. That's my, my duty uh, as First Minister and uh, as First Minister for all of the country. Uh, Sorry, Sev, if, if, if I could just, just continue on that. Uh, that surely, do we not need to know if that recovery will be done with uh, uh, that, that a, will be, a sort of focal point on independence or not? That, that will be a matter for the people of Scotland. Uh, ultimately, yes, do do I think Scotland will be an independent country by then? I hope Scotland will be an independent country as soon as possible. But whether or not Scotland is an independent country is down to not just me, it's down to uh, the, the majority of the people of Scotland. And, and you know, we will, uh, I hope, sooner rather than later get back to having these healthy, important debates about our country's future. But um, I, I'm afraid with, uh, no matter how many times you ask me the same question, my focus as First Minister for all of Scotland, people who support independence and people who don't, is to make sure we tackle, uh, deal with and defeat the biggest threat to our health and our prosperity as a country that we faced in our lifetimes. And, and nothing is going to uh, take me away from that focus right now. Uh, oh, no, sorry, I hadn't gone to Seth Carell from The Guardian. Good morning, First Minister. Sorry, good afternoon, First Minister. Um, the Health Secretary, Jane Freeman, issued a very uh, strongly worded and specific letter to care home owners yesterday about needing to report in detail about their actions on dealing with the coronavirus and testing. But there was no mention in that letter of sanctions. What will you be doing if care home providers fail to live up to the requirements set out in that letter to them? What will happen to them? Health Secretary wrote to, to health boards uh, yesterday as well, so I'm, I'm not entirely sure exactly what letter you're talking about, but 
we, we are working collaboratively. Um, the Health Secretary is making very clear uh, to health boards, to care home providers, what it is that we are uh, expecting uh, done in terms of testing in care homes and the reporting of that so that we can report to Parliament and the wider public. But, you know, we are all trying to work as hard as possible together, collectively, collaboratively at the moment to do the right things. And, and that's the, the basis on which we will uh, continue uh, to, to operate. Um, health boards uh, are working incredibly hard, everybody in health boards, from those who manage health boards to obviously our frontline uh, health staff. And the same is true in the care and social care sector, people working incredibly hard, doing a very good job in, in challenging circumstances. So we'll continue to, to work with them to get the outcomes that we want. Uh, Simon Johnson from The Telegraph. Um, I just wanted to follow up on Martin's question about schools and the cancellation of the ACEL, uh, the, the collection of that information. Um, Professor Lindsay Patterson has described this decision as incomprehensible. He says the present circumstances make it all the more important to monitor individual progress or lack of it, so as to be able to intervene for those children who have been badly affected by the shutdown. And in the absence of this information, we will never know what the impact of the shutdown has been on children's learning. I'd like your view on that. And also, um, you just made a promise to, to um, children from deprived backgrounds to do everything you can to help them. Uh, a University of Glasgow study of 704 teachers, the vast majority of which were in Scotland, um, found only 25 of those teachers said that low attaining pupils were, get, were engaging well with online learning out of those 704. Um, so whatever efforts you are making, um, doesn't it show that you need to be doing much, much more than you are? Uh, look, I'll, on this and actually on everything else, you'll never find me standing here uh, or you'll rarely find me standing here saying, you know, we're doing enough and there's nothing more we can do. I, I, it's not my general approach to things. I've not seen the Glasgow University study uh, you, you quote. I, I often like to read these things in full just in case. I'm not saying that's the case, but just in case they're uh, being uh, quoted, uh, not quite with the full context. But I, I, I don't doubt that that will be a concern because we all know uh, the, the particular challenges that uh, young people from more deprived uh, backgrounds face. O on the point about the data, the curriculum uh, for, for excellence levels uh, data, th there is just a practical uh, issue with collecting that data when schools are not open. Uh, that does not mean we will not be trying to uh, make sure we, we know how young people have been learning and their progress uh, or any areas where we, we have to intervene. And we will continue to take steps. I mentioned the investment in uh, digital technology and, and working with teachers and parents in other ways to make sure that even if they're not in school all of the time, young people, all young people are getting the education that we want them to have. And that will be an ongoing uh, challenge and ongoing work for us for as long as uh, this virus is resulting in schools not operating as normal as, as they would usually do. And, and I come back on all of this, um, I suppose to an obvious point, but one I think it is just useful to bring all of these debates back to. I, I wish we weren't in this situation. There is nothing I wish more right now than we didn't have coronavirus and that our schools were open, that kids across Scotland were right now in schools learning as normal. Uh, there is no aspect of what we're having to do to deal with this right now that is ideal uh, or perfect. Much of it is far, far less than ideal. And there are implications and consequences of that that we have to try to mitigate. And we will do that. But for me to stand here and say there are no consequences to anything that we're doing, it would be wrong and, and not, uh, not accurate. But the other side of that is that if we weren't doing these things, we would be putting people at much more risk of a deadly virus. So we're in a situation just now that is just not perfect and we have to try and get through it as best we can. And that's what I will dedicate myself to each and every day that we are dealing with it. Uh, Rachel Watson from the Daily Mail. Uh, First Minister, can I just go back to face coverings again? You said you're considering making them mandatory. Um, how is that likely to work in Scotland? Would this see people fined for not wearing them or refused entry to shops and public transport? And also on the exemptions for people with breathing, breathing difficulties and such conditions, would they have to carry some kind of proof to get them, you know, to stop them from being fined or otherwise? Look, I understand the reasons why you're asking me these questions, but I, I, I'm going to uh, sort of insist on doing things in the right order. So the reason we, 
we consider these things is so that these are all things that we we take account of and, and come to a view on. So if we decide uh, that we are going to make face coverings mandatory, I will announce that uh, probably at one of these briefings and we will set out then exactly how that will operate in practice. You know, the, the legal route we will make uh, take to make them mandatory, what the penalties, if any, might be for, for breach of that and, and how that would be enforced. But I think it's it's better to get these things in the right order. It would not be sensible for me to answer these questions now before we'd considered uh, in full all of the issues. So we'll set out, if this is the road we go down, we'll set out, out all of this in due course. But let me uh, not forget to repeat the point that we're asking people to do this right now, even uh, without it being legally mandatory uh, and for good reasons. And I'm going to ask Jason, uh, this may be the longest I've ever stood next to Professor Jason Leach without him saying a single word. So um, I'm going to hand over to him just to say a little bit about why we're asking people to wear face coverings, what the, the benefit and the protection uh, that people will get from it actually is. So you should never, first of all, First Minister, feel obliged to bring me in at any, at any time. I realise that creates fear in you and others. The, the, the point here is layering anti-risk on top of the virus. So, so we know for certain, and the, the population of Scotland can't have missed it, that physical distancing is the most reliable method for avoiding the virus. The best protection is your front door. The, these messages have been strong and they've been strong for months. Now, as we begin to move out of lockdown, and we're going to inevitably end up in slightly more crowded environments, but we hope for some time to come not heavily crowded environments, you can see images of London's public transport system. You can see Sadiq Khan saying very, very similar things to the First Minister. We know that there is a layer of protection that a face covering gives you in protecting others from you, and their mask protects you from them. So it, it's simply another layer, like carrying hand sanitizer in your pocket or making sure you don't touch surfaces as much and making sure you don't touch your face. I wish, I was asked yesterday in the media, what's the one thing that will fix this virus? Uh, uh, there is no one thing that will fix this virus. So it's layer upon layer upon layer. And this is another layer. Okay, thank you. Um, and last question today is from Chris McCall from The Daily Record. Hi, good afternoon, First Minister. Um, Earlier on, you spoke directly to younger Scots on the importance of following guidelines. But I wondered um, what you would say to parents, particularly of teenagers, who are allowing their children to socialise in large groups or even, um, you know, having gatherings indoors. I have parents as far as possible. Um, I, I'm not a parent of a, a teenager myself. My, my sister is a parent of a teenager, so I, I understand uh, some of the challenges involved in that. But I would ask parents as far as possible to uh, not uh, have your uh, child uh, be in situations that poses a risk to them or to others and to encourage uh, your uh, child to understand the reasons for that. These are these are not easy situations and I equally understand from uh, the younger people in my own family that the frustration of not being able to socialise properly with your friends and do the things that as part of being a young person is very, very high and getting higher. Um, so, you know, there's, I don't want to sound as if we're being censorious or, or uh, you know, critical of young people. I absolutely understand how difficult this is, but it's about saying clearly, this is putting yourself at risk. But even if you don't believe that, it's true, but even if you don't believe you're at risk as a young person because you're fit and healthy and you don't think the virus is a risk to you, if you transmit it, if you get it, even if you don't get symptoms and you transmit it to somebody else, you could be putting an older relative at much, much greater risk of becoming ill and, and dying. So I, I just ask you to think about that. And, you know, I know it's hard to stay away from your friends, but I promise you, however hard that is, that is not as hard as grieving the loss of a loved one. So, so don't take the risk of perhaps being in that position. There are uh, just under 4,000 people across Scotland who so far have died from this virus. And that means right now, and I'm aware of this every single day when I stand here, there are 4,000 families across Scotland that are grieving right now, having lost somebody to this virus. And those 4,000 families will include young people um, <coughs> who perhaps previously had that same uh, sort of feeling of, of being immune from this. 
Uh, nobody's immune. And even if you think yourself you're at lower risk, none of our families are immune from being touched by this and potentially from being bereaved by this. So I, I simply say to parents and to young people, please stick to the rules. They're not there to make your life difficult or to take the fun out of your life. I know they're doing all of that, but that's not the purpose of them. They are there to keep you safe and to keep your family safe and to keep the country safe. And they will not be in place for a, a single moment longer than we judge that to be necessary. Um, thank you very much uh, to all the journalists for joining us today. Um, my thanks to Professor Leach, uh, my thanks in particular to the Chief Constable for joining us today. And again, uh, let me just repeat my thanks to police officers and staff at the length and breadth of the country who are doing a really difficult job right now exceptionally well. Um, I'm grateful too to Rachel, our BSL interpreter for the day, and as always, very grateful to all of you for joining us. I, I will leave you as we head into the weekend, probably a a rainy weekend, stick to these rules uh, for the reasons I've just talked about. These rules are there for the protection of all of us. And the more we stick to them now, uh, the fewer people will die and the sooner we will be in a position where we can lift more of them than we've been able to do so far. So have as good a weekend as you are able to do in the circumstances. And uh, the Health Secretary will lead the weekend briefing on Sunday and I will be back here with you as usual at 12.30 on Monday. Thank you very much.